Oh, in a previous video lesson, you saw how a typical generator, which uses a either a hand crank or some other method to rotate an axle at a steady rate, produces an AC output, a sinusoidal induced voltage. So here's an example of a different form of generator known as a slide wire generator. Uh, it operates on a principle sometimes referred to as motional EMF. And instead of producing AC, this is a type of generator that can produce a DC output. So I want you to imagine what would happen if we took this um, and moved it into a uniform magnetic field. So first of all, let's look at what we're moving into that magnetic field. There's a resistor connected between parallel rails, and then there's a, a rod that can slide and make contact with the rails with some velocity. Either you maybe grab it by hand and pull it to give it that velocity or some other mechanical method. The rails are separated by a distance we've labeled as L. So we take this device and place it in the magnetic field. Now I think in my picture the magnetic field goes away. Um, so let me move it back down here. So let's consider what's going to happen to the rod, right? Or more pre uh, precisely what's going to happen to the electrons that are in this rod as it moves with a velocity V through this uniform magnetic field. So here we've got um, another view of this rod and it's moving with velocity V through a uniform magnetic field and then we see each of the free electrons or a few of the free electrons. Now every one of those electrons is moving together with the same velocity as the rod. So what happens when a negatively charged object moves with a velocity V through a magnetic field B? It experiences a force equal to QVB and that force is dictated by the right hand rule so for a negative charge why don't you figure out which way these electrons would be forced? Point your thumb in the direction of the velocity vector and point your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So fingers into the page, thumb to the right, and your knuckles face downward. So these electrons would have a force that moves them to the bottom of the wire. This is why we refer to voltage as electromotive force because in the end now these electrons pile up at the bottom of the wire, leaving you with net positive charge at the top of the wire, which means there's a voltage, there's a difference in potential from the top and bottom, and that was uh, produced by the force on the electrons. So instead of calling it voltage, we call it an electromotive force. Okay, so let's look at this diagram one more time. As the rod moves to the right through a uniform magnetic field, then without any battery at all, power can be delivered to this resistor. Let's see if we can figure out a few things. One, what's the induced voltage? Two, um, how much current will flow through that resistor and in what direction? Three, what's the amount of power uh, that uh, provides energy to that resistor? And, oh, well, maybe we can ask a fourth question related to force. Okay. So because this is a, gener a form of generator, it behaves um, in accordance with Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. So the induced voltage, which is the EMF we're talking about, see, once uh, the bottom rail becomes negative, and the top becomes positive, if that's the polarity induced in this rod, then that means this whole rail, since it contacts the rod, is a positive high potential rail, and then the bottom rail that connects to the bottom of this moving rod is at a negative or a low potential, and so there's a potential difference across the resistor that provides the power for it. So that EMF, that voltage that's induced, is equal to negative N D phi magnetic DT N equals 1. This just represents a single loop, right? So we have EMF is equal to negative DDT of the dot product of B and A. Well, the magnetic field points 
into the page and a normal vector to this area would also point into the page. So this is negative ddt of ba cosine theta, but theta in this case is zero degrees, and cosine of zero degrees gives us one. So now we have the emf is equal to negative d dt of ba. All right. So that means the emf is negative ddt of b, how about this? This area is just length times uh, width, width. Well, we'll just say that right now that width is some distance along the x-axis. So this is b times l times a width of x. But the magnitude of the magnetic field doesn't vary in time, nor does the distance between the rails. The only thing that's varying is the value of x. As the rod moves to the right with a steady velocity, then the width that comprises the area of this slide wire generator gets greater. And that's what's creating for more flux, right? You see that as the rod moves farther and farther to the right, more of the magnetic field lines end up passing through the area, and so flux is increasing as the rod moves toward the right. So the EMF is equal to negative BL dx dt. But dx dt is nothing more than the velocity with which the rod is moving to the right. So in the end, we find that the equation for motional EMF is EMF equals negative B L V. Um, gosh, this same thing happens to airplanes as they fly over the North Pole of the Earth. So we call this the North Pole, geographically speaking, and the South Pole, but actually very close to the North Geographic Pole is a South Magnetic Pole, meaning magnetic field lines are pointing downward into that part of the Earth. And then if an airplane were to fly near that region, and a lot of flights go um, circumpolar like this. So I want you to imagine what's going on across the wings of the airplane. So if we take a bird's eye view of this, we'd see the magnetic field lines pointing into the pole of the Earth as looking right, straight down, right? This is the view from above. And then we'd see a wing, and we can just model the wing like this, right? There's the nose of the plane, there's the tail of the plane, and then we've got the wing here. So the wing is made out of metal, I'm assuming, and that metal has free electrons in it. And so the electrons are all moving with a velocity to the right. And then based on the right-hand rule, those electrons get forced to this side of the wing. And so this end of the wing becomes negative. This end of the wing becomes positive. And there's an induced voltage across the length of the wing. That induced voltage is motional EMF, and it's equal to BLV. Now the magnetic field of the Earth is maybe, oh, I don't know, uh, half a gauss. I remember that one gauss is equal to 10 to the negative fourth tesla. So it's not a very strong magnetic field, but the length is pretty large, right? Could we estimate what the length of an airplane wing is? Oh, it could be as much as 50 meters or more. If it's a very large plane, that might be a high estimate, but not too far off. And then what about velocity? So planes fly at... Um, well, several, several hundreds of miles per hour. The speed of sound is about 343 meters per second, and most flights are um, subsonic speed. So maybe we'll say it's going 200 meters per second. So what kind of voltage would you get out of that? Well, grab your calculator and figure it out. 
it's, uh, it's not completely insignificant. So just another interesting example of motional EMF. It doesn't just apply to these slide wire generators, although that's one of the most practical applications of motional EMF. Okay, so that means across the ends of this resistor, there's an applied voltage equal to BLV. Now, which way is current going to flow? There's a few ways we can answer that question. Let's draw the diagram one more time. There's our resistor connected to the rails of the slide wire generator. There's the rod that's moving to the right in order to increase the amount of magnetic field lines that pass through the area. And the polarity, as we saw, ends up negative, positive, positive, negative. So that must mean that current is driven through the resistor from positive to negative, and it continues around in this clockwise loop. So you might say, now wait a minute, I understand how current would go from positive to negative, but then why is current going from negative to positive inside of the rod? Well, that's sort of like the current internal to a battery. In a way, the rod is our battery in this case. It's the source of the um, electric potential difference. So just think of it like this. We saw that these free electrons have a force on them equal to um, QVB, sorry, QVB. And that force pushes the electrons to the bottom. So if electrons are drifting downward, doesn't that correspond to a conventional current that flows upward? So this looks right. This looks like we just have a single value of current that forms a complete counterclockwise loop of flowing current through this circuit. Uh, so the current flowing downward through the resistor is a current flowing to the right in the bottom rail a current that's flowing up internal to this rod, and then a current to the left through the top rail. Okay, how, how much current is that? Well, we just have to use Ohm's law to figure that out, okay? So Ohm's law says current is equal to potential difference divided by resistance. Let's write out Ohm's law in that classic triangle form. Uh, sometimes we say V equals IR. So is that right? Yeah. Current is voltage divided by resistance. So in this case, the current is a voltage of BLV, and the resistance is R. So let's go back to the uh, questions. First one was, what's the induced voltage? That's BLV. Next question is, what's the current? Well, that's BLV divided by R. What's the direction of the current flow? In this case, it's counterclockwise. What about power? Well, we can find the power a few different ways. Power is either current times voltage, or it's current squared times resistance, or it's voltage squared divided by resistance. So let's try this one. The uh, current is BLV over R. The induced voltage is BLV. So we get a result of B squared, L squared, V squared over R. Let's try this form of the equation for power. Current squared, okay, that would be, let's see, B squared, L squared, V squared over R squared. And then I have to multiply that times R. Well, that just cancels one of these, and so I get the same thing. B squared, L squared, V squared over R. Let's try this last version. V squared over R. Well, V is BLV, but we're gonna square that and then divide by R. So what does that give us? Sure, B squared, L squared, V squared over R. So no matter which form of the equation for power you get, you would agree that the power is equal to B squared, L squared, V squared over R. So this question about force. Now here's the thing about um, producing an EMF. And this gets to the Lenz's law part of Faraday's law. The thing about generating electricity is you can't get something for nothing, right? There's no free ride when it comes to energy. So a resistor 
that's being powered by this fashion due to the motion of a rod. Mm, if you were to have maybe just given this rod an impulse, maybe flicked it to the right, just flung it, and then you remove any um, sustained force to continue moving that rod, it would start to slow down. You would move it first, but eventually a resistive force would just show up. And I'm not talking about friction. Even if you made the rails of the rod totally frictionless or uh, at the contact point, it would still end up slowing down. There would be a force that would appear that would push this magnet back to the left. Well, of course there would, right? Let's think about it. There's magnetic field pointing into the page, and then we said internal to the rod, there's this current in the whole circuit that's flowing counterclockwise. So within the rod, if the electrons are drifting downward, then the conventional current flows upward. Now, isn't there another right-hand rule for force that says F equals BIL? And if you point your thumb in the direction of the current, and you point your fingers in the direction of these magnetic field lines, then your palm would face in the direction of force. So point your thumb toward the top of the page, point your fingers into the page, and doesn't your palm face back to the left? So a mysterious force just sort of appears that points opposite the velocity vector for the rod that would tend to slow it down. So if you really want to keep this rod moving at a steady speed, you would have to grab the rod with your hand and pull and provide a force to counteract this force, right? So how strong would that force be? Well, yeah, F equals B I L. Well, let's see. Uh, didn't we find just a moment ago that I is B L V over R? So we have a force equal to B squared L squared V divided by R. Almost looks like the equation for power, doesn't it? Let's scroll back up. The force is B squared L squared V over R, whereas the power was B squared L squared V squared over R. Oh, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Isn't there another equation for power, electrical power? It says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we got this expression based off how we calculate electrical power, but there's an equation for mechanical power that says power is force times velocity. So look at that. If we took a force of B squared L squared V over R and multiplied by V, it would agree with the calculation we got for electrical power. So the mechanical power provided by grabbing hold of this rod and pulling it to the right with a force F to balance out the force that just happens to appear, that mechanical power, force times velocity, matches the electrical power found by either IV, I squared R, or V squared over R. There's another way to think of this one. Okay, Lenz's Law. It says that, um, well, I like to draw this silly cartoon. And this tree is putting up the halt or the stop sign because it sees a coil of wire with a magnet that's moving back and forth, creating a rate of change of flux. In other words, nature opposes the rate of change of magnetic flux. All right? So a rod that slides across the rails of a slide wire generator makes for an increasing amount of flux pointing into the page. Right now, there's just a given amount of magnetic flux equal to the product of magnetic field and area that points into the page. But if the rod were to move over to this position, then there'd be yet another magnetic field line pointing into this area. So I don't know the way to think of it. Is it 
its greater area in a steady magnitude of field, or you're putting more field lines into the area. Either way, we agree that there's even greater flux going into the page. Nature's response is to oppose that. So in other words, to cancel the change in flux. And so, how does it do it? Well, a current is induced. And we found that the induced current goes in a counterclockwise direction. But think about that. Isn't there another right-hand rule that says if you have a current flowing in a counterclockwise direction, use the fingers of your right hand and curl them counterclockwise. And so this loop, this current-carrying loop, has a magnetic dipole moment that corresponds to magnetism pointing out of the page, right? And so the induced current corresponds to a magnetic field that's induced outward, and that outward magnetic field cancels the increase of magnetic field going into the board by virtue of the rod having moved to the right. So in other words, the direction of flow of current is in such a way to try to take the magnetic flux and keep it steady. After all, if it went the other way around, if moving the rod to the right in this external magnetic field somehow generated a clockwise current, which it most certainly doesn't, then there'd be an induced magnetic dipole moment that points into the board, but the increase in flux from moving the rod was also into the page, and so it would just create an even greater overall change in flux, and that's not what Lenz's Law tells us. Lenz's Law says the induced currents will always produce some sort of magnetism to try to oppose the very change in flux that induced those currents in the first place. We'll see more and more examples of uh, Lenz's Law throughout this unit. So anyway, there's a few equations that we can associate with this concept of motional EMF. When a slide wire generator is placed in a uniform magnetic field and the rod is pulled to the right, there's a induced voltage equal to BLV, which corresponds to an induced current of BLV over R. The power through the resistor is B squared, L squared, V squared over R, and a steady force of B squared, L squared, V over R would have to be applied to maintain this steady output voltage.